The following is a listener-supported ministry from the Grace Evangelical Society. In Deuteronomy 1.10, when it talks about Israel's population being very numerous, does this mean that the earlier prophecy about that is already fulfilled? Stay tuned and we will talk about it on Grace in Focus. Thank you for joining us. This is the Grace Evangelical Society's radio broadcast and podcast ministry. If you want to find out more about us, our website is faithalone.org where you can view our free subscription offer to our magazine, Grace in Focus. It's full color and full of great articles, published every other month, six times a year. Once again, that's faithalone.org. Now with today's question and answer discussion, here are Bob Wilkin and David Renfro. David, I believe you have a question from Roger. I do. Deuteronomy 1.10 says, The Lord your God hath multiplied you, And behold, you are of this day as the stars of heaven for multitude. In other words, the Israelites had really greatly multiplied in Egypt. Right. So he says, uh, the question is, on your Deuteronomy episode, Bob said that Israel, which was suggested was two million or so at this time, had not yet fulfilled the promise to Abraham that they would one day be as the stars of heaven for multitude. But does not Moses himself say otherwise in the Deuteronomy passage that I just read, Deuteronomy 1.10? That's a good point. And you're Mr. Old Testament. I know this is your area of expertise, and I don't want to tread in your area. So what was your point about this? Well, when I was in seminary doing a lot of this study, and it became obvious that some of the prophecies— um, had what might be called double fulfillment. Or a near and far fulfillment. Near, a, a near future fulfillment, and then, you're right, and far in the future fulfillment. I think this falls into that category. There were a lot of people that left Egypt in the, the Exodus, in the book of Exodus, you know, probably between 1.5 and 2 million people at that point. But... As we see, there are other passages that talk about them becoming as the star later on. Yes. And I think both can be true. There can be a a near fulfillment of that prophecy, you know, the stars of heaven leaving Egypt, going into the promised land. But then you have other passages that use the same phrase, you'll be as the stars of heaven, later on in Israel's history. It's another sign of blessing, of fruitfulness and spreading of families, the building of families in the Old Testament was a sign of God's blessing. Yes. So it could be accurate to say what I said, that this has not yet been fulfilled yet, and yet at the same time say, but it was in some sense fulfilled. I don't think we'd want to call it partially fulfilled, but maybe say fulfilled in a near fulfillment, but it doesn't deny that there's a far fulfillment. Right. And And that's a much greater fulfillment. In other words, Isaiah 9 says, as to the increase of his government, there shall be no end. Mm -hmm. That wasn't true in Deuteronomy 1.10. No. In fact, you know, Jesus wasn't present and ruling and reigning, but he's going to come back and he's going to establish his millennial reign And then it'll go to the new earth, and his government is going to be without end. And what's anticipated is a Jewish population that's going to be far greater than 2 million. Right. I mean, today, I think, how many Jews? I think the Jewish population is around 30 million on earth today. Mm, On earth, yeah. Somewhere in that range. And the world population is 7 billion. So that's a tiny fraction I mean, it doesn't make Israel one of the greatest nations on earth in terms of size. Right. But there will be a day when Israel is one of the greatest nations on earth. In fact, it seems to me in the millennium, it will be the greatest nation on earth, both in terms of power and in terms of size. Well, not only that, you have multiple kingdoms that had as part of their reason for being to destroy the Jews. and uh, just, That wouldn't be true today, would it? Oh, no, no. no. We're, we're not going to get into that. No. I mean, we'll look at the Assyrians took away the 10 northern tribes. We've never heard of them since then, you know. And then the Babylonians. The Babylonians right after that. And yeah. then the Greeks, you know, then the Romans. The Romans were not nice people either, especially no. toward the Jews. No, in 70 AD, they destroy the temple. And there's no and telling how your... many Jews they killed. 
According during, to what I've heard, I think it was over. I think Josephus said it was over a million. I'm not surprised. So you you have essentially the, the ultimate reason Satan trying to destroy the God's chosen people, right? You know, to show that Satan is, he's trying to show that he's sovereign and over the plan of God. Um, but I think also another aspect of this is to be as the stars of heaven. I would call that kind of a a saying. And it represents God's blessing upon yes. his people. And that is not restricted to one time. Right. You know, God constantly blesses his people. It was 2 million here. It's 30 million in, in the world today. In spite of all of the efforts to commit genocide against them, that shows God's power and his grace and his ability to keep and preserve his covenant people, Israel. Right. And it's a miracle because look how many people, how many, uh, by the way, how many people do you know now are Canaanites? I don't know any Canaanites. Do you? Me, no, no, I don't either. Uh, you know, and there's so many people that we know from history that are gone. Right. But the Israelites slash Jews have lasted all this time. You have to attribute that to God's gracious power. They're God's chosen people. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. And and now in the church age, he's expanded that God's chosen people to Gentiles. Uh, we, we have this new thing called the new covenant, and it includes Gentiles. Well, of course, it's for Israel, but Gentiles are receiving its blessings that's, now. That's right. And ultimately, we'll be under it in the millennium. Well, we'll have glorified bodies, right. but, and et cetera. Please plan to join us at Camp Copus in Denton, Texas. The Grace Evangelical Society's 2024 National Conference is May the 20th through the 23rd. Good fun, wonderful fellowship, recreational opportunities for the younger ones and the older ones, great teaching on the theme of free grace in the Epistles of Peter. There's VBS for kids, too. More information and online registration now at faithalone.org slash events. That's faithalone.org slash events. Please come and join us. Okay, I have another question here. It's about Hebrews 11.1, and David, maybe you could look there. Brad from Wisconsin says, Can you explain Hebrews 11.1? Why is this verse not used more to defend the GES definition of saving faith, that it's being convinced, being persuaded, being certain. So how about reading Hebrews 11, 1? Hebrews 11, 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Okay, that's very good. So it's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Mm -hmm. Now, in the New Testament, hope most of the time refers to something which is certain, yet future, and the timing of the future is uncertain. Well, it's like the hope of our salvation. Right. We're already you know. saved, but we're not yet delivered from this present evil age. But it's that a, it's a required, certainty that it will happen. Yes, when Jesus returns. Exactly. And so we await the rapture and the return of Christ in order to have... I just wrote a blog on the hope of salvation. You can check it out at faithalone.org. Here's what Zane Hodges said in his commentary in the Bible Knowledge Commentary. He says, In a brief prologue, the author sets forth three fundamental considerations about faith, its basic nature, the honor associated with it, and its way of seeing things. In its essence, faith is being sure. And that's a quote from the NIV, which the Bible Knowledge Commentary is based on. Mm -hmm. And it's certain. That's also part of the NIV translation. And he says that's from elenkos, from the verb elenko, to prove or to convince. About unseen hopes and realities. That this is honorable is seen in the fact that the Old Testament worthies, the ancients, were commended for it. Faith is also a way of viewing all experience, since it is the way in which believers see the universe And he points out that Ionios refers to the ages or could even be understood as the universe. For what it is, the universe is the creation by God. So I like Brad's point 
I think we should see in Hebrews 11, 1, a reference to the certainty, which is faith. In mm-hmm. other words, a lot of people say that faith and doubt can coexist at the same time. If that's the case, then faith is not being convinced. It's not being persuaded. It's not being certain. And so you would have people saying, well, I believe Jesus was born in Bethlehem, but I have doubts. I believe Abraham was the one that God called out of Ur of the Chaldees, but I have my doubts. I believe God created the heavens and the earth, but I have my doubts. That's malarkey. You either believe or you don't. I believe Joe Biden is the president of the United States, but I have doubts. Malarkey. Either you believe he's president of the United States or you don't. Mm -hmm. I believe George Washington was the first president of the United States. Either you believe that or you don't. I believe two plus two is four. You either believe it or you don't. A lot of people, they want to say, well, wait a minute. Truth in the Bible is different than mathematical truth or historical truth or legal truth. This is some kind of lesser certainty. No, there is no lesser certainty. No. You're either convinced or you're not. So, Brad, I really like your point, and I think we should recognize that faith is what pleases God. A few verses later in Hebrews eleven six, mm-hmm. that without faith, it's impossible to please him. We need to live by faith. In fact, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, We walk by faith, not by sight. We don't see the kingdom right now. We look around and we see an unrighteous world. We see a world that lacks peace. Mm -hmm. But there is a day coming when Jesus will establish his kingdom and he will establish righteousness and peace on earth. That's right. And we walk by faith in light of that coming reality. Knowing knowing that that will happen. It will happen. It's Mm -hmm. not a maybe. No. It's a certain, but we don't know when. Jesus could return in 2024, but it might be 2124. We don't know for sure. Now, I know there are people who say, well, he has to return within 40 years of 1948. Oops, we missed that. Well, they say it has to be within 40 years of 1967. Oops, we missed that too. So then what do they do? Maybe it's 100 years from 1948 or 100 years from 1967. Mm -hmm. But there is no such promise. All we know is in the first century, they were in the last days. John Mm -hmm. tells us this. And we're still in the last days. Right. And Jesus' return has always been imminent. So really good point there, Brad. Brad and Roger, thank you for your questions and comments. And remember, keep grace in focus. Would you be interested in some free e-books on topics you hear on this program? Well, if you are, you need to come visit us at faithalone.org. That's faithalone.org. We would love to hear from you. Maybe you've got a question, comment, or some feedback. If you do, please don't hesitate to send us a message. Here's our email address. It's radio at faithalone.org. That's radio at faithalone.org. And when you do, very important... Please let us know your radio station call letters and the city of your location. In our next episode, is Hebrews 10.29 about punishment or chastisement? What is the difference? We hope you'll be with us, and until then, let's keep grace in focus. The proceeding has been a listener-supported ministry from the Grace Evangelical Society.